Welcome for another Café Rollista. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm feeling much better now. And today I have the pleasure of having a, a very good friend who's sort of living uh, the dream, but uh, yeah, it's, it's tough, of moving to Japan. Uh, Federico, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Federico. Who are you? I'm for people an Argentinian... I'm an Argentinian games designer, um, and yeah, that's that's basically who I am. <laughs> uh, I have my own company um, called Oracana Media, uh, and I make games. Uh, basically, I've, I've been I've been working in the industry for about uh, I don't know, like four years, more or less, four or five years now. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically it. What? <laughs> Uh, I love following up uh, what you, you're doing because uh, I believe our very first conversation was recorded, so it's in the show, or at least it was our mm -hmm. first. I mean, it was, you were at the very beginning of uh, your Nibiru project, and since then I interviewed you several times, so it's quite cool to see your your journey uh, in the industry. Uh, that's, that's really awesome, uh, everything mm -hmm. you, you accomplished. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, have... I believe that like the first uh, conversation we had was, uh, I think it was like the first interview I gave with you. So yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that was while. Dragon Meat. That was the very first podcast zone, and uh, we've got uh, here mm -hmm. in the chat room today Gary from the Roleplay Heaven uh, with us, who is waving at you, saying hello. Oh, nice! <laughs> Hi, so, Gary. So we've got uh, a couple ice breaking questions. Uh, which was, yeah. uh, what is your routine like at the moment? Uh, I mean, in Japan, uh, what was a, uh, a normal <laughs> day like for you uh, nowadays? Jesus, my routine is, is, uh, is non-existent. Um, I, I generally just like wake up late. Uh, I'm waking up at like a, around 11, 12, uh, more or less. Um, and I generally just like do like very basic admin stuff for like uh, an hour or so and like take a shower, etc. cetera. Um, and then I usually go uh, and I eat outside. I go to like Hotomoto, which is like a, a place that basically sells like boxed lunch. I have lunch like in the park. Uh, I have like a, the Fukuoka's like largest park, um, Ohorikoen. Uh, it's really close by, so I basically have lunch there, and then I go to a cafe uh, that's um, yes, yeah, that's close to the park, and I work for about three to four hours, um, and that's basically my 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 work day done. Uh, after about like three four hours, uh, then I go back home, and then I do whatever I want. Sometimes I continue working from home, but most of the times. I stay chatting with friends. I play games. Um, yeah, uh, that essentially. Uh, and from time to time, of course, like I go out with like friends here and stuff. Going back to Japan is very high on the list uh, for me and Persephilia once we we can afford to financially and that, uh, well, waving my arms at the state of the world, uh, conditions <laughs> are back so people can travel. I really, really look forward to be back in in Tokyo, and uh, it will be great once I'm there to uh, to hang out with you uh, mm -hmm. again. Uh, did you did you engage in any way with the local tabletop RPG scene or game scene in general over there? Uh, yes. So basically, like. Uh, my only problem with that is that like my my Japanese is sort of like intermediate level. It's it's definitely not at the level that I would need to like hop onto a game. Uh, not even like saying like narrating uh, something. Uh, but I still got involved. Um, for example, Kickstarter Japan uh, did uh, like an uh, organized like a like a meetup uh, online for like tabletop creators. So we had that. Um, uh, we are having next month, uh, there's a Tokyo games, uh, um, sort of like convention, 
uh, which I might uh, go, um, though I'm not sure how it's working now with the, with the virus. Uh, I got to check that. Um, uh, and aside from that, like uh, not much else, like uh, before coming here, I was already sort of like engaging online um, with uh, Monterosan um, and a couple of people in the, in the community uh, here that are sort of like bringing games uh, from abroad and, and so like promoting uh, stuff from abroad. Um, and we did the um, the Nibiru Quick Start Guide uh, got like translated Japanese and it's been downloaded quite a quite a bit. Uh, I think uh, we've like sent out like 300 copies more or less. So yeah, it's, it, it's doing its work. Have you heard of people already uh, running the game, uh, having sessions of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I need to. You mentioned Montrosan. Uh, I need to to thank. It it gives me an opportunity to thank Montrosan because he was among the people who were uh, very kind and had a look at Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of inventoring, which there is a, a, a text only version uh, or today on itch because I wanted to include. I wanted to follow the format of tabletop table talk role playing games, so the the Japanese format. So I front-ended it with a replay, which is a transcript of a game session for people who are not aware. And I, I wanted to be faithful to the format, so I asked Montro <laughs> and uh, somebody else from Japan uh, for for their opinion. And uh, yeah, that was very really cool to, mm -hmm. to yeah to to get some pointers about how things should be uh, formatted. So you mentioned Kickstart uh, Japan, but uh, in Kickstart uh, uh, rest of the world, Western world. You recently completed successfully a, a big campaign. Uh, so what was it for and uh, how did it go? Uh, it went well. Uh, it funded. Um, it was basically a campaign for Sanadu. Sanadu is like the first supplement for my role-playing game, uh, the game that I do currently, which is Nibiru. It's a science fiction game of uh, lost memories. Um, so it is kind of like a, an expansion that's based on a particular region of the of the setting uh, of the in-game setting and also of the theme of like collective memory and identity um, and sort of like things that I had lying around that I wanted to kind of like put in paper. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it funded and it's, it's going to be launching in the next few months, hopefully. <laughs> So this supplement was dedicated to Ante Umbra, am I right? That's the least, that's the most civilized part of Nibiru, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so like the, the most like densely populated place. Mm -hmm. So how was that different from your first experience uh, on the first Kickstarter? Uh, it seems like it, it took you much, you had much less time than you did with Nibiru, which was a process which took a lot of years, uh, Xanadu seemed to have happened in a much shorter time frame. Uh, yeah, was it, what did you do differently this time and uh, uh, were there constraints which were different for you? Mm, uh, well, the, the process, like what, what, what took the longest, which was basically just like art production started about probably like eight months ago uh, or so. Um, so that that's basically what took the longest. But aside from that, like uh, you learn so much uh, from your first project um, and, uh, and the same with like the sort of like rhythm uh, producing text uh, for Nibiru, um, which like took a long time for me to like uh, you know, get familiar with my style and uh, become sort of like accustomed to the way I sit down and write and how I organize myself and my thoughts. Um, all of that stuff that had to happen uh, for me uh, during like the writing of Nibiru, kind of like having it done, uh, it it just became that like, yeah, Sanadu was going to be much easier to just like sit down and write because I know how I work and how um, basically uh, the, the text flows and, and how the ideas come and go and stuff. So yeah, uh, it, it was much smoother. And the same with the process of, of like running the, the Kickstarter campaign itself. Um, uh, just like much uh, less stressing, let's say, 
uh, than than the Nibiru campaign was. So yeah. Uh, would you allow me a, a bit of an indiscreet question regarding Xanadu? Yeah, go ahead. That's a bit of a warning. Uh, no, it's just I remembered that uh, when you finished Nibiru uh, and people were asking you about sequels to Nibiru, it seemed like you were not that interested into that. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, why you and how you had a change of art. What was it? Uh, for, I mean, was it a, a sort of something which you needed a, a quick project uh, for, for financial reason or really did you had really a desire to go back or I guess a, a mix of the two? Both of them. Uh, <laughs> so essentially, uh, yes, of course, like financially, it's like super necessary. I live off of this. Uh, it's it's my it's my one source of income essentially, um, but aside from that, I feel like there were certain key places uh, regarding the Nibiru setting and the themes that I should uh, have addressed uh, during the core book. But of course, like because of time and money constraints, etc., and, and not knowing how well the game is going to do in the first launch, uh, you never know like well how is it going to to go if it's actually viable to like release all of this uh, content and stuff like that. So the game did very well uh, after like two years. Uh, so it kind of allowed me to like put into the pages like stuff about like, I don't know, for example, Enki's Covenant, which are like the main antagonists uh, in the game that weren't really developed that much uh, in the core book like here. Okay, now I can like explore them in depth and and going through that thing um uh but yeah it's, it's a good, good question because there there is something of that like uh, i had a reticence for like a while of uh to release something but there's also like a particular reason for that that i can go into if you want to sure i mean if it, if it's not indiscreet uh, uh i'd love to hear about it yeah, no, it's, it's mostly the fact that it's it's related to how, uh, like, first of all, I like uh, supplements that service not just the storyteller or not just uh, the players. I like servicing them both. And I like basically covering the whole range of, like, um, content types, let's, let's say, because I could... I wouldn't do like, for example, a supplement that's only creatures or only AI or only like lore. I want to be able to like service everything. So um, doing that like requires time. Uh, it's 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 a big task because uh, you have to like design all of this stuff. And I, and I also wanted to, I wanted to kind of like get a, a cool concept together because uh, just launching like extra stuff just wouldn't be my style. Um, I wanted to like tackle a new uh, theme. So like uh, taking the, the thing about like collective memory and, and group identity based on that, um, as well as it was also the fact that like Nibiru is a very light, light system. Um, so it, it already runs uh, very well with how it runs uh, in my opinion and just adding more stuff and, and putting stuff stuff on top of the game um it can it can make it quite unwieldy um uh so for example like what i did now with sanadu i think that's kind of like as far as i can take that system uh without like making it like overly bloated uh if i tackle like the next supplement i would need to like think of something completely different like for example okay in this supplement I give you the choice uh, or mechanics to like not play Vagabonds, but play something else, uh, for example, um, while still giving you like uh, lore and stuff that you can use on your normal like Nibiru game and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my, my, my thought process or why I was hesitant for a while and I ended up doing it, but it's still like one of those things that like next supplements, uh, you know what not to expect. <laughs> It's, it reminds me a bit of, uh, it seems to be a trend among designers, which I find very interesting to make different games which are set in say, the same setting, the same universe, or different corners of a shared universe, but with different focus and different game mechanics. Uh, in the English-speaking world, uh, 
uh, I believe probably the most famous. Well, you've got Trophy Dark, we got Trophy Gold, and a couple other games uh, I don't remember the name of, but you got Spire and Heart by Grant Towit and Chris Taylor. Uh, so mm -hmm. is that the sort of things you have in mind? Like if you go to if you go to Humbra with one of your supplements, would you take a significantly different system to really explore the the despair and the darkness which uh, which qualifies this area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, I could totally like do a game uh, where you basically play uh, Asapu. Uh, so people that have like this. Uh, are like living with this parasite that allows them to live in this like super oppressive um, high artificial gravity uh, thing and maybe you could do like a system where like one of the players plays the parasite and the other plays the host and stuff like something like that and, and sort of like give you a chance to explore something new in the setting is, is, is what interesting me the most um, it is more interesting from a design aspect and it's it's also something that like uh, again, if, if you start, if you continue to add stuff to a system like uh, the, the Nibiru uh, system, it, it becomes unwieldy. So yeah, that's that's kind of the, the idea. Yeah, and, and I find, I mean, it was the case of a lot of older, much older system that even if you include something as optional, players tend to consider them uh, mandatory <laughs> and rather than pick on a the buffet of rules, they end up uh, trying them all at the same time, which is, which is really... Uh, really unwieldy. Uh, you posted mm -hmm. some art, uh, which I believe is of your next project. So your next project is not a Nibiru game, it's something else. So what is it? What is it about? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is Zephyr. Uh, it's uh, the next game. Uh, it's basically what's going to come after Sanadu. Uh, and it's... Uh... <laughs> can i call it this yeah it's 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 essentially it's it's sort of like an honor kissed uh fantasy game of uh winding identities uh so that there's a lot to digest there um it's basically a game that is set on top of like a sentient landmass uh so it's basically like a continent that walks um and this sort of like continent is powered by the titular Zephyr. So Zephyr is 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 kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a what's it called um, a force of nature. Uh, it's it's kind of like the wind, the mountains, the rivers. Everything is made out of this thing, um, and the characters um, are also made out of that. The wind folk, the people that uh, the players uh, play as, um, and it has a lot of like stuff that is tied to to that like force of nature and uh, how it basically it's it's basically that they're they're people that are made out of like feelings in a way uh so this this force of nature is representative of feelings like hatred and and sorrow and hope and stuff so everything is is, is there's like a metaphysics uh, aspect to it that's that's quite cool um but yeah that's that's kind of it uh I still don't have like the uh, the what's it called the elevator pitch that polished, but uh, that that is Zephyr. That's that's coming out. So are you far? Where do you start? Where, what do you start with with a project like that? Is that a, a doodling? Because I, I know you're doing the the art yourself. Did you start it or something and then to oh I could do something with that? Is that an idea of a a rule system or some mechanics or uh, is it? You start imagine the world and and then you you come up with the rest of it. So what's what sort of a starting point for something like Zephyr? Uh, yeah, it's it started doodling. Um, I in fact the the logo of my company, the Arcana Media logo, is 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 like a, is is a wind folk. Is one of the the people of the set of the of the setting of Zephyr. So it's been like a while. Um, and uh but it's it was basically like i wanted to do uh to explore like thematically the theme of like if i did memory and identity with nibiru i wanted to do feelings and identity uh with uh zephyr so i was like okay let's say that you have these people that are made of pure feelings like they're um uh, how how does like identity relate to that 
And I started thinking, well, uh, technically everything that makes you who you are or, or forms your identity uh, is probably like a collection of ideas, concepts, people and places uh, towards which you have a particular feeling. Um, I have feelings, for example, with regards to uh, the country that I'm in. I have feelings with, for like my family, my friends, uh, my job. Like I have feelings for a particular, I don't know, like uh, movie that I've watched, etc. etc. But uh, everything that's outside of your sphere of existence is stuff that you don't really know or you don't have like a sentimental tie to. Uh, or something and those feelings could be like super negative uh, like a big part of your identity could be made by like the hatred towards like something that you have and I, I thought that that was like really interesting and the idea of building a character by declaring how they felt about different aspects of the world would be really cool especially if then I make the feelings an actual concrete force of nature that you can sort of like uh, manipulate and, and do magic and stuff with so yeah that's that's sort of like the concept that started it i really like how nibiru is about the memories and the game you discover is about the feelings and i love it in the way that it goes really into the uh, what's going on in the mind of someone you know rather than say okay you can uh, lock picks and it's your skill and it says you got a percentage and the idea is that well you were trained and you are that uh dexterous with your hands and so on here it's about no it's about your past that you were a thief in the past of some kind and that's a memory you have or no it's about that you are i don't know you have this feeling of uh you, you're able to concentrate or you really want to push through that door uh it's uh on one hand you do the same thing on the other end it's entirely different because the way you approach it is completely different mm -hmm. we've got yeah, totally it's a design philosophy thing. Yeah. We've got Gary who asked uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Gary is asking, is there something personally that influences your role play game? Uh, personally? Um, mm, I mean, like everything, like I, it's, 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 it's sort of like my art. I, I generally, uh, write stuff to express how I feel or like uh, express something that's important to me. Um, like for example, in, in Zephyr at least, like um, a big chunk of it has to do uh, with the way like society is organized and my own gripes with society and stuff like that. So a lot of uh, what I'm reading and what I am sort of like digesting at the time uh, goes into the games. I draw like a lot of inspiration. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's basically it. I, I, I draw much more in inspiration about stuff that happens to me, like in, in normal life and stuff like that, uh, for my games that from other games, I don't really mu read many other games though. I should. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's once, you know, I guess it's like, uh, I'm producing a podcast. I still listen to a lot of podcasts, but not necessarily tabletop role playing podcasts because you're you're not you're not available. It's difficult to to be both a consumer and a producer uh, sometime. Uh, the the other question uh, from Gary mm -hmm. was regarding uh, specifically to your artwork, and there again, uh, what what sort of your influence on on your artwork? Uh, you know, looking at the Z some Zephyrs you posted, I, I was wondering if you had if you would say that there's an influence from the Kod the Kodama in something like Princess Mononoke, the, the three elves, or yeah, this sort of things. Mm. Mm. Um, I, the inspiration that I take like for, for the artwork particularly, uh, there is a couple of artists that I like, like all of them graphic artists, uh, Hannah Christensen, was one of my first influences because I saw her art on uh, Netrunner uh, and I really, really liked it. Um, uh, a lot of like gouache and uh, and like really, really vibrant colors that I really liked. Um, there was uh, one guy uh, called uh, 
um, I think jo uh, Joao uh, Bra Bragan or something like that is a Portuguese uh, artist uh, that also does like really, really cool and whimsical stuff that I, that I at least I got some influence from that. Um, but yeah, mostly it's, it's from like artists that I see in ArtStation. ArtStation is, is sort of like the uh, marketplace uh, for uh, digital artists and, and sort of like recruitment for digital artists uh, that we use in, in the industry, or at least some people use in the industry. <laughs> so yeah. It's an amazing platform because you, you find there are people who work in... Uh... Uh, comics, tabletop role-playing game, illustration of books, uh, video games, and even cinema. So and everybody's got their portfolio there. And it's really mind-blowing the amount of talent you got there and talent which is within reach from people who are in so many different countries. It's really fascinating to see how you can you could hire uh, brilliant artists in, uh, in different parts of the world for a project. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating. Also, you posted. I, I think it would. Um, uh, I do a bit of graphic design, so I did the text-only version of of Paris Gondo, and I did uh, some. I do a mm -hmm. bit of graphic design as part of of my work as an architect and urban designer. But I find it fascinating that for Zephyr, I saw you and you posted on Twitter, already doing art but already putting them in a layout uh, while you're still busy writing. I think if I was doing all of that together, the art, the graphic design and the writing, I would, I would, I would fall into trying to have everything perfect from the get go. And in the end, everything would come to a halt because I would be just making small amendments uh, to all of that. How do you, how do you manage your, your workflow uh, doing all of that at once? Uh? So my, my like graphically, I'm, I'm a very like graphics uh, sort of like uh, focused person. Uh, so I really like seeing how or envisioning how the final product will be. Uh, that's why like pretty much um, everything that I write in Nibiru, I write it on like the layout uh, program. I don't have like, a, oh, wow. I don't do like um, word or or google docs or whatever i generally just like write it on affinity publisher in this case um and just so just so that i can see how everything flows and how everything is looking because like yeah I, I care a lot about that and the same with like zephyr like with zephyr particularly it's challenging because like zephyr is um illustrated from the front to the back like every spread is an illustration so there specifically the way the text flows and the way sections sort of like uh, overlap and, and sort of like a chain with one another, uh, you have to have into account the composition of the image and how much space it allows for like text and stuff like that. So it's it's important there particularly to um, to see everything, at least for me. Uh, we've got Richard from the D20 Future Show who asking a, a question which is a bit connected. He's asking if you have any tips uh, about how you go about to writing a game. Uh, what, what do you start with? Do you have an order and this sort of things? Oof. <laughs> Richard loves process. That's uh, what he's saying in the chat room. And it's true. Each time he shows up, he has a question uh, about people's process. We need to see some of your own work, Richard, by the way. Um, so if it's about like how you sit down and write something, um, I generally start, like, I, I basically do a, a summary of like, uh, what each paragraph is supposed to be telling. Like, I don't know if, if that was like what the question was about, yeah, sure. but I say, for example, this paragraph, um, is about like introduces the reason why the people settle in this place. And the next paragraph uh, tells you um, what sort of challenges they faced in at the at the beginning. So I basically like uh, say what each paragraph uh, in the in the chapter sub chapter explains, and then I basically start writing. And I generally uh, like do. Um, I don't like write everything uh, and then I go back to edit. I edit as I go because I, um, I, I don't like going back and reading a 
big block of something I've written. I like <laughs> like doing it uh, bit by bit. Um, of course, that goes to my editor afterwards, but uh, uh, that's the, at least that's how I write. Uh, in terms of like design again, that's that's different. <laughs> so consider considering this process of integrating it to to the layout and so on. So you you have an editor. Do you have a graphic designer also who looked after things? after you you did or no it's all yourself uh, it's that's all me yeah mm -hmm. so but uh... like like for for zephyr the for zephyr i think the only thing uh, that's going to happen outside myself is is the editing uh, basically so i just finished work with an editor uh at the pleasure of working with chris s sims for paris gondo uh, how much room do you, is there still for your editor to intervene on what you've written when everything is already integrated and in affinity and you, you set yourself a set of constraints which are so, so strong? Uh, what's your, your process with the editor in particular? I no, I, I make it like as easy as I can on my editor. I move everything to like Google Docs. Uh, so I move everything to Google Docs. Uh, they edit in Google Docs and then I move back to uh, the original layout. It's convoluted, but it works for me. <laughs> uh, I, th I think for Nibiru, you run a lot of play tests at conventions. Uh, what are your plans with Zephyr? Are you planning to run online play tests or try to run it in English in, in Japan? Or... No, not yet. Not not in not in English in in, in Japan. Like uh, by the time Zephyr launches, uh, I will still be in uh, school in like Japanese uh, language school, uh, so I won't really be able to to do that yet. But I'm gonna run it online. Uh, I'm, I have like my own game group that I'll be testing it with. But to be honest, it's one of those things that like at this point, it's uh, it doesn't require that much testing. Um, in fact, like. For, for a lot of stuff, like testing is just like not needed. Uh, it's, it's not like a necessity. Uh, there's a couple of things in particular that I want to test, like very specific things, but overall, like uh, like it's 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 easy to expect how like the the, the game is going to work uh, in this or that situation. Uh, I think so, yeah, that's that's my plan. I'm asking because one of the uh, I've been running quite a, a few air quote play test of Paris Gondo and it was in part inspired by you in Nibiru and the advice of Gary also in the chat room regarding the fact that uh, it was important to raise uh, awareness regarding a project before you you release it before you even consider doing a Kickstarter and this sort of thing so uh, does that mean that with Zephyr you trust the I don't know the community the established community of Nibiru fans to be interested also in this different projects or you think it's it's strong enough to to stand on its own without having this uh preliminary sort of uh, promotion um good point on calling out that like uh, or or at least that that's what i got that like uh, play testing is mainly for promotion because that's that's a misconception like i think uh play testing's main thing is about promoting your game um but um what do you mean it's a uh, misconception I, I th what's the misconception because i think that it's uh i think there's a misconception that like the the main goal of play testing the game is to actually make the game yeah. work and stuff like that or <laughs> yeah it's it's mainly about marketing um uh, it's a very complex uh, topic. We can we can go into, but uh, but that at least is my opinion. Um, in terms of like Zephyr, I, I don't think there's a lot of overlap uh, between Zephyr and Nibiru. There are extremely different games, even though at the core there are of course similarities between the thematic axis because you have memory and identity and feelings and identity. But aside from that, they're like super different. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure like a lot of people that like Nibiru because of like the way it pushes you to like uh, create stories, like it, it might resonate with you with Zephyr, but Zephyr is very different. And I think it's going to create its own audience for sure. 
Mm-hmm. You, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in your opinion on stuff like uh, p- promotion through demonstration and so on, because I, I find you interesting in the way you have very strong opinions regarding the tabletop RPG industry. So in, in that way, you sort of remind me of some French designers, but where I find you pers- personally, it's just my opinion, more interesting than a lot of French designers. It's not, it's not a criticism. It probably sounds like one, but it's you still uh you still see that as an industry with which you engage and processes which are normal to engage into promotion and and making your book look good and this sort of things why i know a lot of designers while I, who are can be critical of the industry but their reaction is to turn into a sort of a uh, author mentality and they get in their little bubble and they de- they do their projects for with with very different ambitions again it's it's not a criticism it's, it's more a comparison but i think you still engage pretty much with the industry while being critical so i find it's it's interesting that you're you're still constructive with that industry uh d- despite your yeah the, those opinions yeah, I also don't know if those uh, those designers do it as their main job, but like usually, at least I don't have a choice. <laughs> in yeah, that well, sort there's, of thing. there's something like that. It's true that those designer decide or are in a situation where uh, they have other means of income. Uh, sometimes by choice. Sometimes uh, what I see, and I see that with podcasters also, they can be critical of people with more commercial practices but at the same time sometimes themselves regret that they cannot leave out of what is their hobby but at the same time they are not willing to commit to to do the work which is doing all this stuff and consider those realities which is uh, consumer psychology financial ways and uh, yeah and the industry and so on mm-hmm yeah, basically. <laughs> so uh, you you also, when you were m- telling me about moving to Japan, your ambition there was also to get into the video game industry. And I believe there are some things. Uh, can you tell about those things uh, already or not at all? Uh, there are some things moving behind closed doors let's say um that are not like entirely in my control uh they might relate to Nibiru, uh but it's very early to uh to tell i would like to eventually do uh like a game uh myself at the moment i'm very focused on like sanadu and zephyr uh so yeah uh, i i really can't do much but in the future uh yeah that's it's it's a medium I'd like to explore, uh, for sure. But you, yeah, but you're you're writing, you're editing, doing the layout and the art of the fear, and on top of that, you want to to learn to uh, uh, do everything which is needed to do a, a video game. Then uh, uh, learn to use Unity It'll come and later. all of that. <laughs> I I already I already know how to use Unity. I've I've, I've done like. Uh, sort of like testing and prototyping and stuff like that. I've, I've already done that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in fact. Um, but now I've kind of like left that aside because uh, I'm, I'm focused on this. Um, it's, it's not one of those things that I would do at the same time I'm doing a, a role-playing game, of course. So it's going to be a couple of years uh, before I tackle that again. Uh, Richard was asking after asking you for tips for writing. Now he's asking for tips for page layout. So do you have a, a, a secret which does not require a YouTube video tutorial to explain about uh, how to do a page layout? Honestly, um, th- that's the thing. Like for example, I think layout is one of those things that I've done mostly by intuition. Uh, so there, there ain't much that I can like just explain, but, um, I, I, I basically say like, keep it very simple, like two columns. If you're doing like us letter size, which is the the standard size for like a, a book, two columns is great. Um, and 
sort of establish establish a hierarchy. I think it's it's very important for you to establish a, a hierarchy of what your contents are going to be. Like, uh, for example, Nibiru is basically, um, I'm, I think to myself, okay, what do I want? If I want to do like a book like Sanadu, I want to include something that is about this particular city. I want to add something that is about like creatures. And I want to add something that is about like new mechanics. Um, so, and everything goes into like a particular theme. For example, the theme of, I don't know, like uh, social inequality. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I have three things that I want to do, the city, the, the, the bestiary or whatever, and mechanics, that's three chapters. Um, I'm going to make an introduction to kind of um, give like a hub, let's say, uh, that also explains the connection between everything and, and the themes. Um, so when I do my introduction um, or any of those chapters, I'm going to be like, okay, um, what do I need to explain? I'm going to divide it into sections. For example, um, in the section about the city, uh, I want to uh, basically uh, do the story, the, the history of the city, um, an overview like with a map or something like that, and then go into like each district uh, and then go into like the life of vagabonds in the city and gameplay ideas. So that's four sections. Uh, so in, in, in every bit of like the, the stage in which I create the, the hierarchy, I think about the assets that are involved. So first the chapters, okay, the chapters are going to uh, have like an opening uh, spread and it's going to be basically like a big image and the name of the chapter, I just slap that in there. Um, everything outside of that, um, like I have then in the hierarchy, the uh, so like sections of the chapter. So our city uh, chapter has four sections. Those four sections could be a header that I use that I say like, is the name of the section and the number of the section. Um, and then everything simple in like two columns. And within each section, I think of subsections and I'm like, okay, each subsection that's going to explain, for example, this district or that district or this uh, part of the history gets a title. And then I go into like my paragraphs, how I mentioned before that I do it. And it's very like simple, two columns, um, uh, everything like as readable as you can. Uh, and, and, and yeah, thinking that every bit in the hierarchy has its own, uh, graphic assets. So how are they going to look? Um, uh, for example, with color, Nibiru has a very simple, uh, color palette It's mainly blue and contrasting with orange. So if you keep everything to those two colors uh, generally and black and white, of course, um, it's going to look pretty well meshed together. Uh, think about the themes of your game and the colors, like what the colors represent. Uh, make sure they either complement or, or, they, or they contrast or something like that. And start thinking about those particular assets for each uh, step of the hierarchy. Um, that's that's basically the way I I do lay out. It's it's mostly intuitive. I, I haven't studied anything, so yeah, uh, I'm I'm sure people are much better out there that that can explain it better or or yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, looking at what you post on Twitter. Also, uh, your approach seems to be have the picture as big as possible, have the art as big as possible, because the last few slides you posted. It was huge. <laughs> it was awesome yeah. across this spread. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's what's coming now uh, with both Xanadu and Zephyr? Do you have uh, d deadlines or, or things which are planned that should arrive soon and people should look uh, out for? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for for uh, Xanadu. Uh, I mean, the deadlines are are basically. Uh, I want to have the books delivered by November, 
um, I'm pretty comfy of like finishing uh, sort of like the, the design and stuff and illustrations, etc. the interior of the book uh, by June, July, more or less. So that gives me like a, like a, a comfy window to like do production and ship books out and stuff like that uh, so that they arrive by November. Um, uh, aside from that, like now, I'm finishing writing uh, the book because like there's stuff that still needs to be written, especially with like the stuff that people have unlocked uh, through like stretch goals. Um, so once that's done, uh, my, my sort of like daily routine is going to shift mostly uh, to um, basically Sefer because my, my part on, on Santa will be done. I'll still be like laying out art as it comes and in communication with like my editor and, and doing sort of like this back and forth. Um, but mostly it'll be Zephyr and, it, and Zephyr is still like in this weird stage where I'm doing mostly world building um, and uh, illustrating um, and really just like very casually just going in and, and writing stuff. Uh, it's mostly like the process of world building that takes like more work than almost anything and uh, everything else. Uh, the same was the case with like uh, Nibiru um, and illustration because like in Zephyr, it, it has so many pieces of art. Like think about the fact that if I want to do uh, one spread, uh, like pretty much everything like from front to back done and each illustration is a spread. It means that if I want to reach like 200 pages, I have to draw like 100 illustrations. Uh, so that's <laughs> going to take a while. <laughs> so you're not going to do something like, because I thought it was also very interesting, what you did with Nibiru was to have sort of three categories of illustrations and three different artists taking care of those so they could still be assembled. They fair as 100% you then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, honestly, it's, I love working that way because this is like the most me you could call like a, a project. It's, it's very personal. Uh, yeah, it's wild. I mean, it's um, so impressive. All everything done yourself. Uh, it's yeah, it's really, really impressive. And uh, yeah, I cannot imagine a, a, a project being more personal than that. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's very hands-on. Uh, it's very enriching to like work in that way because I, I really really like the process of illustration, and particularly because I've done illustration for uh, for Nibiru and uh, and for Senadu too, of course. But then I have to sort of like adapt to the style that is already uh, sort of like prevalent for Nibiru. Whereas for Sefer, it's it's my style, so I can basically do whatever I want. <laughs> uh with it or, or not that i can do whatever i want it's just that i'm very comfy with how i'm working uh with it so yeah it's it's pretty cool amazing well i look forward to uh to that uh, i look forward for my finance to be better also because i did not uh, pledge to xanadu because i'm i think broke <laughs> at the moment hopefully i will be able to pledge uh for the fear. don't worry <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much. It's been a, a pleasure catching up with you, Federico. Uh, I, I hope uh, we'll be mm -hmm. able to uh, enjoy some time together someday in Japan or maybe if you visit us uh, again uh, in London. Uh, where can people mm -hmm. find you? Uh, where's the best place to, to follow what you are up to? Um, so the best place to do so is via Twitter. Uh, uh, Twitter is basically at uh, Aracana1. Uh, can write that like later. It's uh, it's fine. But uh, I put it Twitter, in the, the uh, description of one. the episode. Now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aracana.com. That's uh, my website. So uh, that's where you can buy Nibiru, follow on like the mailing list, and uh, check out like the the blog for stuff that comes out and stuff like that. So yeah, it's uh, that's that's basically where to find me. And uh, is it still possible to do late pledges to order Xanadu? Uh, I mean, Nibiru you can purchase on most platforms, including your own website, which I, I guess is the best. Uh, but uh, yeah, Xanadu mm -hmm. can people still late pledge and this sort of things? Uh, I actually 
uh, like you can't like uh, now I thought I had like uh, enabled it but I actually haven't because I have to check like the the, the platform that I'm using is, is kind of fiddly um, it's pledge box um, but uh, it should be open in in like a little while I just have to like sort myself out to that platform so yeah great well I will include a link to that uh, uh, as well uh, I will invite mm -hmm. people to go check uh, the itch store of the release for Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of inventorying. I launched today a campaign to finance uh, the next step, which is a graphic designer, because I've got notions of graphic designs, but uh, I'm both <laughs> not good enough and too knowledgeable with graphic design to be satisfied with my own work. So I want to hire someone, and there's a text only edition, uh, but you already have everything you need there to play Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring, and to spark joy. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is there. It's just uh, I'd like the game to look better, and I'd like to purchase some art. Uh, the first step is a graphic designer. Then the second step will be art, and you you can you can go there. And uh, I'm already super thankful to the people who's been purchasing. The five people already purchased the game this morning. I'm uh, super thankful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks, Federico, and uh, well, uh, best wishes of success uh, with Zephyr, and uh, congratulations on uh, uh, successfully crowdfunding uh, Xanadu already. Cool. Thanks for you, Chance. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. And thanks, people in the chat room, for joining Bye -bye. us.